Hey, welcome to Madhouse Magazine Radio Hour. We got a special show tonight. We have a full hour dedicated to Frankie Previtt. That's right, the Frank- Frankie Previtt. Frankie and the Knockouts and uh, Dirty Dancing fame. So Frankie's here. He's got a new uh, c- box set, uh, you would call it, or a CD compilation. And we're going to talk all about that. We're going to talk about Frankie's life, career, everything you ever wanted to know about Frankie Previtt. Oh. And then some. So uh, <laughs> I actually probably know more about you than you do now, Frank. I uh, was researching you last night. So uh, <laughs> I'd like to talk about this uh, police report thing that I uncovered uh, <laughs> last night. Uh, <laughs> Back in 1964. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So before we start the show, the whole time we're going to talk about everything. Did you know you were in a band called Bull Angus? <laughs> <Did I? laughs> yes, you were. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Frankie and the Knockouts. We're going to talk about Dirty Dancing, everything you ever want to talk about. But first, of course, since uh, we are now owned by Madhouse Magazine, we have to uh, pay the bills. So we have to read their stupid articles uh, every week. So here's one about Jimmy Page and Phil Collins. You guys know Jimmy Page and Phil Collins, I'm sure? Absolutely. But there's been a simmering feud between these two guys for 30 years. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Ever since Live Aid. So Jimmy Page pranked Phil Collins recently, and it was a little crazy here. So let me read the whole story to you. In what turns out to be a cruel but hysterically funny prank, Phil Collins was anally impaled by his own (laughs) drum stool. Anally? (laughs) Led Zeppelin guitarist Jimmy Page was the mastermind of the prank of the century. Page invited Collins over under the ruse of jamming and to discuss a possible Led Zeppelin reunion. Page removed the screws on the drum stool and strategically cut a hole so that at the right time the supporting rod would come thrusting up through the seat. (laughs) All was go according to plan. Collins arrived, we had some tea and a chat, and then I said, let's have a little jam session, giggled Page. (laughs) We started out with a slow blues jam, but then I kicked into rock and roll, and I knew he would try to keep up. During the second verse, it happened. The stool Damn. collapsed, and the support rod came bursting through the stool <laughs> right up Colin's oh. bum. Me and the crew were laughing hysterically. I never laughed so hard in my life. Collins was screaming and writhing in pain. It was great. <laughs> I have been waiting to get that wanker back since 1985, said Paige. I will never forget how he made me look ridiculous during the Led Zeppelin reunion at Live Aid. He said he would play drums for us and then shows up without learning the songs. He sat there grinning like a moron during Black Dog. <laughs> I have been plotting my revenge for over 30 years. Hmm. Now who looks ridiculous, laughed Paige. Phil Collins, you know, he just smiled and said, good one, Jimmy. <laughs> There you have it. All the news, not fit for print. Madhouse hey. Magazine. <laughs> That's a real jam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, so before we start the whole show, we're going to actually play some songs now. And, of course, we're gonna. it's an all Frankie and the Knockout show. Well, it's all Frankie Previtt show. So we're going to start off with Sweetheart by Frankie and the Knockouts. And then we're going to play Pot of Gold from Bull Angus off the debut album, 1971. Mm. And we'll be right back. <laughs> Madhouse Magazine, Radio Hour, 474, The Mix. Actually, I'm not singing Pot of Gold. Get out of here! <laughs> Come on! I thought you sang all those songs. No, Pot of Gold, I'm not singing that song. Ah, <laughs> we'll have to edit that out. Should no, I do a different one? First you get them lost, then you pick the wrong song. Oh That's it. Hey, welcome back. Madhouse Magazine, Radio Hour. You just heard, what did you just hear? Sweetheart by Frankie the Knockouts <laughs> and Sweet Marmalade from Bull Angus. So now we're going to get right into it. We're going to find out everything about Frankie Previtt. So let's start from the beginning. I'm very interested where you, I'm assuming you grew up in New Jersey, but tell us about your influences. How do you, how do you just first come about, uh, you know, getting into music? Who are your, your favorite bands? All that kind of stuff. Really it was, um, music was kind of a, a genetic thing. My dad was an opera singer and my mother and father met taking uh, voice lessons from oh. the same vocal coach. So I was kind of their duet, so to speak. And then um, when I was <laughs> four years old, uh, I used to sit home and watch and listen to my father uh, rehearse. And so one day my, my mom took me to see my father perform at uh, Convention Hall in Asbury Park. And I remember that because I remember sitting on my mother's lap and hearing a lot of people coughing and watching my dad. And then he was singing Paiachi. And he went to hit the high note, and I remember in, in him rehearsing that this high note was coming, so I stood up in the chair, and I belted the high note. <laughs> ah. 
right before my father could hit it. And the whole place uh, cracked up. Did you hit the high note, though? Oh, I must have. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And my father stopped the concert, and he looks out, and he goes, my son. Uh, and everybody applauded. So that was my first that was, my yeah, first that's gig. It. You were hooked. Yeah. That was my first gig. <laughs> so uh, from then, you know, I was just always doing singing, you know, charging my grandmother a nickel to sing a song. Franca, come on, I'm singing a song. <laughs> <laughs> so, Aww. you know, what, what happened for me was that when I turned about 11, 10, 10, 11 years old, my dad would have me singing in these uh, charity events for cerebral palsy, and I would sing all these Italian songs that I had no idea what I was singing. And Be My Love and, and uh, Mario Alonzo songs and things like that. And then when I was 13, I started my own singing group. And um, it was called, believe it or not, Frankie Love, L-U-V. Oh, nice. And Ooh. The Intruders. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And so, uh, we got signed to London Records when I was 15. Get out. Yeah. That's wow. awesome. Yeah. Um, the guitar player in that band became a really famous uh Session player, Jeff Marinoff. I don't know if you know that name or not, Jeff Marinoff. Anyway, uh, from that, uh, the record, did nothing really happened with that record, but I continued to want to be a singer. And my parents said, as long as you, you know, go to college, come out of college, you can be anything you want. So the day of graduation, I didn't go to graduation. I went on the road with a rock and roll band. Wow. Yeah. And I was up in Boston. And um, it was a cover band, and I realized at that point that I wanted to write songs and I wanted to, you know, do original stuff. So I left that band, and I came home, and there, I picked up the Aquarium, and I opened it up, and there was this band looking for a lead singer that was signed to a label, and they were called the Oxford Watch Band, and they were playing at a club called the Cheetah in New York, which is uh, I think S I R is there now. And so I, you know, I was in a band that did, you know, Otis Redding and Sam and Dave and Wilson Pickett, and I was listening to a band that was doing Moby Grape and Buffalo Springfield. <laughs> and I was like, man, I don't know one of these songs. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm looking at, you know, all these long-haired guys and me, the Italian greaser. <laughs> and, and so I, you know, they said, you know, tomorrow, come in, sing for us. And I said, all right. So... I went in and we started naming songs and I said, do you know Try a Little Tenderness by Otis Redding? And they said, yeah, we know that song. I said, okay, well, I know that song too, so let's, let me sing that for you. So I sang Try a Little Tenderness and they gave me the gig. Nice. And I, um, the sax player helped me learn how to play sax because they had two horns in their band. And so from that, you know, I learned sax and flute and recorder and started playing that instrument which really helped my breathing to sing. And from that band, the drummer and I started Bull Angus, which ah, was signed to Mercury Records. <laughs> and um, So can, can we stop there for a second? I wanna, I'm fascinated <laughs> about that time of your life in Korea when you're just getting signed to these the pun, people. Right? Yes. <laughs> like, uh, like at what point, how did you get, Mer you were signed by Mercury, you said. So how did these guys come and find you or did you go to them? How did you get signed? Okay, so... The band, Oxford Watch Band, was signed to Capitol Records, and we had um, re recorded at uh, Ultrasonic Sound Studios in Hempstead, Long Island. And the production team was Shadow Morton and John Lindy and Vinnie Testa. And those were the guys that produced, like, the Vanilla Fudge. Oh, okay. And, and so being in that recording environment, when I split from the Oxford Watch Band and we started putting together this Bolengus band, we played at a place called the Sugar Shack in Columbus, Ohio. And the owner of that club was affiliated with uh, Jeff Franklin, who owned ATI, which was a big, big agency. And he came in to see us, and he said, I got this guy, Vinny Testa. And I go, yeah, I know Vinny Testa. He goes, I'm going to send him out to, you know, to check you guys out, and if he likes you, you know, maybe we can get your record deal. So Vinny Testa called me, and we had five minutes into the conversation, I realized... He didn't know who I was. <laughs> and I said, Vinny, it's Frankie. <laughs> and he goes, oh, my God, who else is in the band? So I said, it's me and Gino and four guys from Poughkeepsie, New York. <laughs> so he came up and saw us and signed us and uh, brought us into Ultrasonic. And we started recording. And uh, I remember playing Red Hook High School on a Friday night 
And then Vinny said, next Saturday you're at the Garden with Stuart. Uh-huh. Wow. All right, so we can't just Red glance hook. over that. We have to. <laughs> Stuart yeah. is Rod Stewart. You ever hear of him, Estelle? Uh, uh, maybe. maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. yes, because <laughs> I actually uh, I looked this up, too, and I was uh, fascinated, amazed, shocked, and then we have to talk about this, playing Madison Square Garden. That uh, I actually have the date here. I wrote it down. Uh, what? What was the date, Chacha? I, get, I put you inside. November 26, 1971. That was just uh, anniversary. Mm-hmm. It was your, you played with uh, another band, Cactus, who yeah. has like the Vinnie Apiece, Carmine Apiece yeah. in it. Uh, one of those yeah. Apiece guys, right? Well, uh, Vanilla Fudge. Believe it or not, Cactus was the reformation um, of the Vanilla Fudge. Okay. So you had um, Carmine on drums. You had Timmy Bogart on bass. You had Rusty Day, who was from uh, Mitch Ryder and the Detroit okay. Wheels on guitar. And, um, uh, no, Jimmy McCarty, excuse me, on guitar. And Rusty Day was the lead singer. And that was an ass kicking band. That band, yeah, yeah. That band was mm-hmm. really, really that good. That must have been some show. They, they used to come into our dressing rooms and they used to call us the boys, you know, because we were the, the greenhorns. <laughs> we're going to teach you how to rock and roll. And they'd come in and take like a garbage can and they'd shove it through a window, and kick, <laughs> kick our window in. That's how you rock and roll. <laughs> uh. So yeah, so wow. we got we got to hear about this because it was sold out show, twenty thousand people you're playing oh in front God. of. This is amazing. This is Madison Square Garden, arguably the most famous venue in the entire world. Definitely, if you're from the New York, New Jersey area, right. it's the most famous venue. Right. Everyone plans and lives their whole life playing there. So tell us what it was like that day when you first found out you're playing Madison Square Garden, and then go up to the actual show. Well, you know you dream of playing a place like this so yeah. we were in a hotel and uh, they had a, a limousine pick us up to take us to the garden and as a kid when i was 18 years old i used to play the metropole cafe on um i believe it's 7th avenue around i don't know 48th street and it was a strip joint <laughs> and uh, so we got caught in a traffic jam in front of the metropole cafe so it was like a big flashback for me. Here I am going to the garden. <laughs> and I used to play in there right. with the strippers. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we got there. And the good thing is that, you know, um, my parents were able to experience these gigs with me. Oh, awesome. Standing on the side of the stage. And being, you know, playing with Rod Stewart, you know, it was when he had Maggie May was, was Right, huge. this was the faces. Oh Ron God. Wood did yeah, it with him. Oh, my God. One of the, at that time, they you were the biggest band in the guess. world, pretty much. Yeah. And so as a, as a young entertainer, as a young songwriter, singer, that's the school of rock for me. Mm. You know, that's, that's where I went to school, watching somebody of that caliber entertain and ingratiate an audience and, you know, you you learn from these experiences of these other guys and not that you won't copy them but you yeah. know you emulate and you make it your own and you see what works and doesn't work and you know so i played probably you know two months madison square garden of every town that we went to with rod stewart wow. and, and then with deep purple and then with oh Fleet my goodness with mac. Fleet with mac wow, yeah. wow. Oh, this is awesome yeah so <laughs> oh my I can't God. even imagine this. Uh, <laughs> we need to take this in. Yes. Like, uh, <laughs> uh, so that that must have been some backstage stories there right. with Rod Stewart. They were yeah. notorious partiers, and there must have been chicks running wild backstage. <laughs> I'll never tell. <laughs> <laughs> he used to crash our press conferences, though, because he, he knew that all the press would be there. And if Rod Stewart walked in the room, you weren't getting press. That's right. you know? <laughs> oh, that jerk. <laughs> <laughs> it's his show, you know? Uh, I'm, so just, I'm just a guest. <laughs> there's uh, another show. I actually I saw this on YouTube. They just had the audio, video of it. They didn't have an audio. It's like an old 8 mil- millimeter film. It was from... Uh, mm. August 1972, Schaefer Music Festival in Central Park. Right. You remember this? I do. You were playing with Quicksilver Messenger Service, That's huge band right. at the time, yeah. and a band I had never heard of called Pure Food and Drug Act. Yes. And, of course, you guys. And, you know, the, that all the biggest stars in the world were playing there, too. The next week, I saw the Doors were playing there. B.B. King, Edgar Winter, everybody was playing. So what was it like uh, playing that in your hometown? 
It was awesome, um, you know, to play any type of gig that, that brought those kinds of crowd. We we actually were lucky enough to play the Pocono Mountain Festival with 300,000 people. Get so, out. I never even so, heard of this event. So talk about being freaked. You know? <laughs> 300,000. Yeah, that's were, like... There was a line of traffic back 20 miles. People would just park their car and start walking. That's like Woodstock. Yeah, do you so, remember what year this was? It yeah. was um, in 1971. Mm. Okay. And uh, there was it was a three-day uh, festival. And so, I mean, just everybody who was anybody, even Humble Pie and Three Dog Night and, and Emerson Lake and Parma. Get and, out. You know, wow. All, all of these bands. And I, I remember it vividly because... As I stood on this stage that was about 20 feet high in the air, and I looked out, and I couldn't see the end of the people, <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. Oh my God. <laughs> and I looked down, and there's my mother and father in the oh. front row. Oh, and I'm looking awesome. at them, and I'm seeing this bottle of wine be- with acid in it. Oh, no. And people are like... <laughs> And passing it on to the next person, and it's getting closer to my parents. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and, and right when my mother went to grab it, I yelled uh, out, Don't drink the wine! You know? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's really that's really good. <laughs> uh, it would be a whole different story if well, your maybe, mom actually did yeah, drink the wine. Yeah, maybe that's maybe the she point. did, and that, that answers a lot of questions. Uh. <laughs> Uh, that's a lot of good stuff, yeah. That so now, I great. actually, I was not familiar with Bull Angus. I'm usually familiar with lots of things. So I listened to both albums. You had two albums, Bull Angus and Free For All in 72. Right. Right. And uh, they were great albums. I really enjoyed them. And it's like this progressive kind of rock. It sounded a lot like you mentioned, uh, Humble Pie. It sounded a little like Humble Pie, Grand Funk, Deep Purple mixed right. in. And you had your own sound. You like amazing musicians. We, we, had stuff. A, we had a name for our sound. We called it Riff Rock. There you go. Because, because of all the, the riffs mm-hmm. that we would play. You know, there's a song, Miss Casey, on the first record. And there are all these riffs, and we'd go from one riff to a power chord to another riff. And so we just said, you know, we're, we're doing riff rock. Yeah. Riff rock. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I do. It's yeah, great. it's good stuff. So now we have to find out what happened here. Because you guys, it sounds like you're riding the wave here. You guys are on top of the world. And that was it. You only did two albums. So what happened? Behind the music here, what happened? Well, our manager at the time, and I'll I'll leave his name out so I don't embarrass him, um, got in a a kind of a misunderstanding with the guy who uh, signed us to his ATI. And um, so at that point, he said to our manager, you know what? I'm done. Just take your little group and go away. And so because of... Their misunderstanding, it ended up hurting the band. Mm. We were in the studio actually recording a bunch of new songs for the next record, which, you know, one of those songs was Sweet Marmalade. Oh, okay, cool. And so I figured I would stick that on there because that's a song that never really made light of day. And uh, there's 11 other songs that are on the new CD that are songs that I wrote after I left Bull Angus, I was signed to Buddha Records as an R&B artist, and Tony Camillo, who produced Midnight Train to Georgia, I recorded uh, for him in Buddha Records, and he became my producer. And I wasn't, wasn't really feeling the energy that I was used to from the music of this riff rock band, riff rock band with my R&B th- thing that was going on. So from that... I took those two sounds and the guitar player from Bull Angus, Billy the Kid, Billy Elworthy, and um, I formulated a blue-eyed soul rock and roll band called Frankie and the Knockouts. There you go. (laughs) That sounds like a good spot to take another break and play some more music now. And we're going to come back. We're going to talk all about this new CD you have here. And we're going to start off with Frankie and the Knockouts. So let's take a break and we're going to play some more music and we're going to play Hungry Eyes by Frankie and the Knockouts. You guys may have heard that. And another Bull Angus song. I hope you're singing on this one. It's Savoy Truffle, the Beatles no, cover. No, but you, <laughs> but what you can play is Miss Casey. Alright, so forget Savoy Truffle. You guys all know that song anyway. It was by the Beatles. Go listen to that one if you want. But we're going to play Miss Casey by Bull Angus. And we'll be right back. 474 The Mix, Madhouse Magazine, Radio Hour. 
<laughs> hey, welcome back. Madhouse Magazine Radio. Uh, 474 The Mix. We just heard Hungry Eyes, Frankie and the Knockouts, and Miss Casey. Is that right? Miss Casey. Off, what you uh, trying to do? Angus. So now we're going to talk about Frankie and the Knockouts. Let's start from the beginning of this band now. You formed this band, and we have these two albums here. If you're watching on TV, if you're listening on the radio, yeah. you cannot. But um, tell us a little about, well, first, how the band got started, continue on from there, how you recorded your first albums, all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, well, you know, I started, you know, leaving the R&B scene to try to formulate this harder blue-eyed soul sound. And I was selling cars out of my driveway. Were and, they your cars? No. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's where the jail thing comes in. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> And um, I was had Billy, Billy the Kid, Billy Elworthy, living with me. And he said, I have this guy, Blake Levinson, keyboard player, who's playing with this girl, Rosetta Stone. And uh, he's a really good keyboard player. So let's write some songs together. So we started writing some songs. And I met this guy named Burt Padell. And Burt Padell was known as the accountant for the stars, Madonna, Luther Vandross. Just everybody was anybody, you know, knew Burt Padell. So I got introduced to Burt Padell, and Burt Padell took my demos, and he played them for Jimmy Einer, who was the president of Millennium Records, and Jimmy called me in, and what Jimmy heard in my voice was that doo-wop thing, because Jimmy, back in the day, was in doo-wop bands, and then he became a producer of Three Dog Night and The Raspberries, and did a John Lennon record, and you know he just became a really, really big time producer, and he started his own label distributed by RCA. And so Jimmy said, "You know what? If you can write a few more songs, I'll give you a record deal because I really like your voice a lot." And so I went back, and I wrote uh, "She's a Runner," and he goes Hollywood, and uh, one other song, I "Think You're My Girl." And um, I came back, and he says, all right, I'm going to give you a deal. He goes, you got a band, right? I go, oh, sure, I got a band. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's an ass-kicking band. It's really good, man. It's good. I didn't have a band. I had these other two guys. <laughs> and so, you know, I put you know some guys together to go that I did my demos with, and we went and did a Frankie and the Knockouts record. We had no endings. Everything was faded. So, you know, it was like, okay, great. You know, we'll see what happens. So this guy, Michael Kleffner, was managing us. And Michael Kleffner also managed the Jefferson Starship. And he said, there's a show Fridays. It's on Friday night. It's like Saturday Night Live. And I oh, said, yeah. yeah. He that. goes, check that show out this week because, you know, the Starship's on. I said, okay. So I'm watching and Larry David comes out. Yeah. And he goes, and next week's guest, Frankie and the Knockouts. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I said, oh, there, there's no band. So Michael calls and he's all excited. What do you think? What do you think? I got you this gig. I said, Michael, there's no band. Oh. Goes, there better be a band by next Friday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we rehearsed two songs and put endings to them, Sweetheart and Comeback. And we went for the first time as a band live on Friday Fridays. Wow. I hadn't gigged now in three years because I was writing songs trying to get a record deal. And so we did these two gigs, and the next day was Saturday, and we did American Bandstand with Dick Clark. Oh, oh man. And, That's on weekend. Wow. And the next day, it goes on. We played Solid Gold with uh, oh. Dionne oh, Warwick. Man. Oh, <laughs> and then Michael said, in two weeks, you better have more songs because you're on tour with the Beach Boys. Get out. Wow. And that became Frankie and the Knockouts. Wow, that's some um, uh, intro. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and the best isn't hasn't even happened yet. That's the thing. Like, it just keeps getting better and better. <laughs> uh, now, this song, Sweetheart, that you mentioned, that went to number 10 on the charts. That's it, a top 10 hit. That's amazing. It is amazing that an unknown band... And a kid from New Brunswick that dreamed one day to hear his song on the radio was hearing himself sing on the radio, <laughs> driving what was, down Livingston Avenue. Is know? that the first time you heard it, sweetheart? You heard it uh, driving, driving around in the down car? down Livingston Avenue, yes. <laughs> wow. Did you open the window and tell everyone, hey, this is me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I just was telling myself, this is me, oh, pinching yeah. myself. That's pretty awesome. Wow. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you, you had uh, two other top 40 hits with that band. Yeah, uh, uh, You're My Girl and Without You. So, like, and who did you go, who else did you tour with with this band? Um, you know, we played with a lot of different people. Um, I enjoyed playing a lot with Toto. Mm-hmm. You know, we Steve Lukather, great yeah. guitar player. And, and it ended up that Jeff uh, Picara, the drummer from Toto, came in and played on Come Rain or Shine on our third record, Making the Point, which you don't have there. Yeah, I have the first two albums here. Look at this. Well, the reason why you don't have the third album yeah, there. Yeah, tell there, us about there, this. There's a reason. Um, Jimmy Einer decided he was going to close his label because RCA uh, didn't want to give him the, the amount of money he needed to promote his band, so he sold us to MCA. And MCA said, we're going to make you sound like Night Ranger. <laughs> and I said, and why would you do that? <laughs> you, you already have Night Ranger. We want two Night Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a long night. <laughs> so uh, they brought in Night Ranger's producer, and they took a track called Outrageous, and they went and remixed it and put it out as our first single, and radio was like, nah. This is not Frankie and the Knockouts. And so there were other songs on that record, like Come Rain or Shine, uh, One Good Reason, Blame It on My Heart, that would have been right in the pocket of Frankie and the Knockouts and what radio was used to. But they didn't, and they dropped us, and the man upstairs had a different plan for me because the next two years I spent writing songs trying to get another record deal, and one of the songs I wrote was Hungry Eyes. Which, en- which ended up uh, being in a little movie called Dirty Dancing. <laughs> Did you guys ever hear of that movie? Mm. Yes. <laughs> and there was another song that happened upon me during that time, and if you want to talk about that, we oh, can. Sure. Well, do you want to <clears throat> let's talk about this CD first, and we'll sure. work our way into Dirty yeah. Dancing. You got it. So on the CD, um, it's all three records. Making the Point is on there, which... You know, I consider my songs like my kids. Of course. You know? So I, this third record, Making the Point, it gets my kids a chance to get out there <laughs> and be heard. <laughs> and there's a lot of good music there on on that third record that I think people would like and embrace as a Frankie and a Knockout fan. I'm doing a lot of interviews in the U.K. and finding out that there's a huge fan base in the U.K. and Germany and, and the Netherlands for Frankie and the Knockout oh, fans. Oh, cool. And... Um, you know, other radio stations where um, that broke sweetheart um, all around the country that, you know, I'm doing these, you know, radio stations and, and people like you, you know, that have your show. And so it's great to know that there's a fan base for the music that this music, Frankie and Nakas music, still lives. So that that's a good thing. Absolutely. And then the label asked me to put some bonus tracks on. So I, like I was saying, I, I took 11 songs that... Haven't really seen the light of day from Bull Angus, from me as an artist, an R&B artist on Buddha, to some songs that didn't make a knockout record, to songs I wrote with Kazim Sultan and uh, Mark Rivera. Kazim Sultan, if you don't know who that is. He's Utopia, the ba- Todd Runger. He, he's the bass player for Utopia. Okay. And uh, sax player Mark Rivera, who plays with Billy Joel, and he's the musical director for Ringo Starr's All-Star Band. We had a band for a minute called Brave New World. And so um, we, we went out and, uh, you know, tried to do some gigs with that band. And so I took all of these songs and I put, it, put them on here, kind of like my journey to the Academy Awards. And so also on here, which I really, really am proud of, are six tracks of Frank In and Knockouts Live. And oh, why, cool. why I'm so proud of that is because when you first write a song, you know, it's like the first two weeks and you're still learning, you know, the feel and the lyrics and, and what the song is about. And then you play it out. And as soon as you start playing it out, you know, and you see the reaction of the audience, you know what works and what doesn't work in that song. And you're tweaking and fixing. And that's when a band should record their song. So these are Frankie and the Knockouts after we learned our songs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds like a good stuff. <laughs> So now, and on here, is that the demos you have on there, too? Or the, uh, I, I didn't put the um, Time of My Life and Hungry Eyes on here because they are on um, my website for pancreatic cancer. I have a, oh, okay. I have a, a website on Facebook called uh, Dirty Dancing Demos, 
and I donate um, all the money from those demos that they actually filmed the movie to me singing in time of my life and hungry eyes along with Rochelle Capelli on time of my life. And um, when I met Patrick Swayze at the Academy Awards, he told me how important that song was to the movie. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, we didn't have a song. You know, we filmed that a sequence. We filmed that last scene first and we hated this movie. I go, you hated the movie? He goes, because we didn't have a song. We learned that last scene to a good song, a Lionel Richie track, but it wasn't, it wasn't an original song. So he goes, so we listened to 149 songs, and yours was the 150th cassette <laughs> that came in in 1987, and we played it, and we went, we're making a movie oh. to that song. Oh. And he goes, at the end of the day, the ending of the movie was so tremendous that the camaraderie that we had was like a 180 let's go make a movie and the next day we filmed to hungry eyes so he goes without that song he goes we wouldn't have wouldn't have had this movie and it really without patrick swayze without jennifer without eleanor bergstein's story without the song without those elements the phenomenon of dirty dancing wouldn't have happened right. yeah absolutely you needed everything, everything. to it was a perfect strike storm. at the right. same time exactly yeah and i actually even heard i'm not sure if this is true but it, patrick swayze said he liked your version of the song better well you know what these you get demoitis, I call it. <laughs> you know, you get so used to hearing somebody sing it and you've recorded, right. you've filmed, you know. And, and the same with Hungry Eyes. They they kept on saying, you know, we, lo we love what Eric's doing, but, you know, uh, and, and we're, we're just too used to Frankie. And Frankie did this. <laughs> and, and Eric goes, kiss my ass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm singing it my way. <laughs> How'd they get him to sing the song, Eric Carmen? Where'd well, they pick him out of? Well, Should have let you sing it. Well, they asked me to sing it. You know, Jimmy said, you know, we want you to sing it. So I, I went and booked time at the power station, and I got uh, Larry Alexander to engineer for me. And then Emil Ardolino, who was the director called me up and said, I got another scene I want you to write a song for. So I went in there, and he goes, oh, by the way, before we start, what's the BPMs for, for Hungry Eyes? Because they're having a hard time linking it up to the demo. So BPMs, if you don't know what that means, it means beats per minute. And so they were trying to link up, because they filmed the movie, to my BPMs. Oh, okay. Then they needed his BPMs uh. to sync to them dancing. And I said, why? We're recording it Monday. And he goes, no, you're not. He uh. goes, Eric Carmen is recording it in Cleveland. He goes, he's in, you're out. Yeah. And I go, when was somebody going to tell me that? <laughs> <laughs> and so Jimmy Arner said, just be happy you have a song in a movie. I said, I'm happy, I'm happy. Uh, so, uh, well, you know, uh, yeah, you it kind of worked out good. Yeah. So, yeah, it was, uh, you know, like you said, it's a perfect storm. Everything comes together amazing. It was. It really was. So now, tell us, because now, of course, it was a blockbuster movie. Cha-Cha herself saw it 27 times. Yeah, at least. And, um, oh, by the way, Estelle, after this, you and Frankie are going to recreate the end scene when he lifts <laughs> yeah. you up over his head. So, you know that. I hope you're ready. Right? <laughs> We're ready. doing the lift. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I've been practicing. <laughs> Secretly. Uh. So, so now, tell us when you went to the Academy Awards. That must have been another exciting time. Oh, uh, man. Well, you know, the Academy Awards, um, and I thought it was the right thing to do, was I brought, you know, my parents. Oh, Aww. man, you pa your parents must wow. love you. Do you have yeah. any siblings, by the way? I have an older sister. She that, must hate you. That, uh, no, she's, she's, <laughs> she's a doctor. She lives in Princeton. Oh, she she well. There you go. She's <laughs> doing okay. <laughs> hey, all right, all right, that's good. <laughs> um, you know, I don't really, um, you know, I remember sitting there, my mother and father next to me, my father listening to all of the other songs that were, you know, chosen for the Academy Award. And he goes, Psst, you're going to win. Oh. <laughs> and I go, do not put the Maloiki on me. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> do not do that. <laughs> and so I told the guys, because I was in the middle of the row, and they were at the very end, if we get nominate uh, if we get you know if we win do not run up there because they'll start the clock and we only got 30 seconds <laughs> oh. i'm in you the middle of the row. row it's going to take me 30 <laughs> seconds to get out if you will lucky. <laughs> yeah and so 
They announced that us as the winner. And do you know who, who uh, announced us as no, the winner? No, I do not. You don't? No. Oh. Uh, trivia. Lee, quick, Google this. <laughs> <laughs> you made What's us that? leave our phones. <laughs> Deadly Moore. Ah, oh, nice. Oh, L- Liza Minnelli. Oh, wow. man. And, and, and what was also a very cool moment for me was the Golden Globes because Sammy Davis gave oh, me Oh, that would be even cooler. Oh, yeah. my God. I yeah, love yeah. Sammy. Yeah. So those were really cool moments to, oh, nice. to meet those guys. So um, I don't remember walking up there. I bet. You know, but where was it? It was in L.A. somewhere. Yeah, it was in L.A. And oh, um, you know, it was. It changed my life. Oh, know? Of course, it, yeah, it absolutely changed my life. I I went from being Frankie the singer to Frankie the songwriter. <laughs> yeah, and my song became bigger than me. Mm-hmm. And hey, I'm okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm good with that. Yeah, just think about this. It was a number one hit. You won uh, an Academy Award. Yeah. How many people can say that in this room? Nobody. How many people in the <laughs> yeah. world can say that? About 72. <laughs> exactly. For music, about 72. Wow. That's amazing. So that's something, no matter what happens, they can never take that away from you. Well, you know, the year was a really, really good year for me because, like we talked about, the, the Golden Globes and then... Uh, I got a, a Grammy nomination, and then the song won a Grammy for the be- uh, best duet, and then we won ASCAP Song of the Year, which means the the most played song in the world. So it, it got played over a million times. Wow! In, in a year, so you know to have those things happen to me or are so far beyond my dream of me hearing my my song on the radio that you know. The person that really wrote that song was the man upstairs, because I had oh, no idea. Yeah. So I had no idea what that movie was about, and I wrote, <laughs> I wrote it on the Garden State Parkway <laughs> exit 140, wow. going in and in, I'm of my life, <laughs> going in and I'm of my life. What the hell am I saying? <laughs> and I scribbled time of my life on an envelope, and that's where the seed of that song was born. Wow, uh, that's um. I pass there every day. I take the parkway yeah. that way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna request the governor put a plaque. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, so yeah. we can <laughs> have the hungry life. eyes bus stop. <laughs> ASCAP, who who uh, monitors how many times songs get played. It's they have the top twenty songs that ever have been played. It's number fifteen. Wow! So, uh, happy birthday actually is number one. <laughs> oh, That's pretty wow. good company. Yeah, and uh, number five is one of my favorites, which is my girl. Oh, oh, there you go. Oh, yeah, yeah. There you go. that's something. I gotta look up that list. Yeah. Yes. I hope Disco Duck is not on it. Oh, right under. Oh, I got. Number fourteen is Disco under Duck. Disco yeah. Duck. <laughs> yeah, I didn't make the cut on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah, that's, that's why right. when you go on to future interviews, and if anyone ever asks you what song do you wish you had written, use Disco Duck. Disco Say that one. Disco uh, Duck. That'll throw people well, off. Well, happy yeah. birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, all right. So now, what about uh, commercials? I see the song in a lot of commercials and a lot. Do they have to ask your permission or they just send you money? Both. <laughs> oh. Have you ever turned anybody down? Was it anything? Yes. Uh, yes. Like the pens really? ad or something? Uh, I think um, <laughs> uh, maybe Trojan Rubber. <laughs> yeah, that was a good time of your life. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. I should rethink that one. Why would he turn that down? <laughs> Because <laughs> uh, just the other day I saw it's on a new uh, KFC commercial that it's like oh, the Colonel yes. and Ma- Mrs. Ma- Butterworth, yes. and they're recreating that scene. I wonder if they have a kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's chicken and waffles that they're selling at KFC. That's and, it. Yeah. That's their kid. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, you having fun? Absolutely. All right. Good stuff. <laughs> So now, do you have any plans for a uh, book, a tell-all book coming out anytime? I don't have really have a book. I, I thought this um, this album could kind of be my musical book. Mm-hmm. Comes out on Friday Music, which is FridayMusic.com. If you want to pick up a copy or Amazon, you can get it there as well. And it kind of gives the history of me um, as a musician, as a songwriter. And um, what I'm doing now is I put a show together with the uh, production company from Jersey Boys. Oh, oh, nice. wow. And uh, the show is entitled Calling All Divas. And we'll be playing at the uh, Keswick Theater in, in uh, March. Okay, that's in Pennsylvania, yeah. right? Yeah, right outside, there, of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, outside of Philly, great little theater. 
And uh, other theaters, we're hoping they uh, come back and do the Count Basie in Red oh, Wing. That's and then nice. um, some other theaters around Jersey and the metropolitan area. And it, it's a, a little outside of my realm of as songwriter because I had to write like a play, but yet it'd be a concert. So it's about four different girls at different times of their career. And they are found by Frankie the songwriter who is looking for the next star to sing his hit song and bring and break her through this guy's nightclub. And he brings all these four girls. He finds one in a subway. He finds one in Harlem playing in a blues club. He finds one in a country bar and one in a recording studio. And he brings them all in to audition for this Mr. D. And Mr. D can't make up his mind which girl he likes the best. And so the second act opens up, and he goes, I wonder, uh, I guess you're wondering who I picked. And he goes, there was only one winner, obvious winner. And that winner is, and he announces the winner. So you'll have to come to the wow. show. Ah, I'm already uh, yeah. Yeah, intrigued. Okay. I've seen it. Oh, you have you? It. Don't tell. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Thank you. Well, wow. Here's that check <laughs> I owe you. <laughs> <laughs> My publicist. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So I have not uh, introduced everyone on the panel here. Of course, we have Chacha. We have Estelle, the uh, director of photography for Madhouse Magazine. And, of course, Frankie Previtt. Well, let me just and say this. We, we had uh, several photographers that came to that show that evening in New York at the St. James Theater. And Estelle's photos were absolutely nice. killer. Aww. Killer. Good job. Yes. If That's anybody good. really wants uh, to have a photographer, you get Thank a hold. You. Get a hold of Estelle. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. There you, you, go. you deserve it. Good You're very stuff. Good. Great eye. All right. So, anybody else got anything else that you uh, want to talk about? We're running out of time here. So that's it. We're gonna wrap it up. Otherwise, Frankie, last word. Thanks for having me. Thanks oh, for coming thank on. You. It's been an amazing it's, career. Yes. Very, very good stuff. And everyone go out and buy that CD. Oh, one other word. Just one other word. Please go to my Facebook page, and it's um, Dirty Dancing Demos. All the money goes to the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, and a dollar from every one of these CDs goes to the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network in memory of Patrick Swayze. Right, he passed oh, away of yeah. pancreatic cancer. Very sad, very Thank sad. You. Thank yes, you. Yes, so good stuff, man. So, all right, so now we're going to wrap this up. We're going to play some final songs before we go out. We're going to play Time of My Life, Frankie and the Knockouts, featuring Rich, Rochelle Capelli. Actually, there's a version I, can, I should give you with... Uh, uh, Lisa Sherman singing it with oh. me. All right, we'll play that, that one would too. Be wonderful. Or instead. Yes. Awesome. Sorry, Love. Rochelle. <laughs> You're out. <No. laughs> Are you in touch with any of these people still from Bull Angus or Knockouts? <laughs> uh, from Bull, from Bull Angus? Um, yeah, the uh, keyboard player and uh, the uh, guitar player. Uh, so, Ronnie Piccolo. What and, about um, and Larry LaFosse? What about doing a um, reunion concert? Not a tour, but maybe one show? Uh, you know, there could be. Um, they've been asking me to do some Frankie and the Knockouts, put a you know small band together and do some Knockout stuff. So there's some thought about that. Well, I just got word you're appearing on Saturday Night Live yeah, in three say. days, so <laughs> you better get that band together. <laughs> we know he can do it too. <laughs> I got the formula for that. There you go. All right, so we're gonna play Time of My Life, and then we're gonna play Without You, another Frankie and the Knockouts classic, and that's it. That's all we have. We're gonna play the Artist of the Month and wrapping it up. Manos Magazine Radio Hour, four seventy four, the mix. Let's hear it for us, Frankie Previtt. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah.